Picture this, a quiet town nestled in the heart of Massachusetts where nothing much ever happens. But on one fateful summer day in 1892, everything changed. Andrew and Abby Borden, a wealthy couple, were savagely attacked in their own home by an unknown assailant wielding a hatchet. The grisly crime sent shockwaves through the nation and left the small town of Fall River reeling. The killer seemed to vanish into thin air, but suspicion soon fell on a most unlikely suspect, the Borden's own daughter, Lizzie. What followed was a riveting trial that captured the imagination of the American public, full of dark family secrets, revenge, and a haunting question that still lingers to this day. Was Lizzie truly guilty, or was she an innocent victim of circumstance? In the heart of Fall River, a prosperous textile manufacturing town in the late 19th century, the Borden family lived in a stately home on 2nd Street. At the helm of the family was Andrew Borden, a successful businessman who amassed a considerable fortune through his various investments in real estate, banking and textile mills. He married Sarah Anthony Morse in 1845 and they had two children, Emma and Lizzie. After Sarah's death in 1863, Andrew remarried Abby Durfee Gray in 1865. Lizzie Andrew Borden, the main suspect in this case, was born on July 19, 1860, in Fall River. Lizzie was well educated for a woman of her time, having attended the Fall River High School and the Wheaton Female Seminary in Norton, Massachusetts. At the time of this incident, both Lizzie and Emma, now aged 42 and 32 respectively, were living in their father's house. Andrew Borden was a man who held on to traditional ways and refused to indulge in the modern amenities of his time. Despite his considerable wealth, he chose not to install electricity, private bathrooms or city water, which was considered a common luxury among the wealthy at that time. This created a divide between him and his daughters, who were embarrassed by his frugality and perceived him as lacking in empathy. The sisters called their stepmother Mrs. Borden and believed that Abby had married their father for his wealth. According to their maid, Bridget Sullivan, whom they called Maggie, Lizzie and Emma rarely ate meals with their parents. Adding to the family tension was a gift in the form of a house that Andrew gave to Abby's half-sister a few months before the tragic incident. The gift heightened the sister's concerns about inheritance and caused resentment toward Abby. Lizzie and Emma felt that their father should take care of them as well. In response, the sisters bought their childhood home from their father for one dollar and then sold it back to him for five thousand dollars shortly before the murders. In May of 1892, something strange occurred in the Borden household. Andrew Borden, Lizzie's father, took it upon himself to kill multiple pigeons in the barn with a hatchet. This unexpected act of violence left Lizzie shaken, as she had recently built a roost for the pigeons. As if that wasn't enough, a burglary occurred in the Borden home shortly after with precious jewelry and cash stolen from the master bedroom. But here's the twist. Andrew ordered his daughters not to discuss the burglary with anyone. Could it be that he suspected Lizzie of the crime? After all, she had a history of shoplifting. In July of 1892, another family argument erupted and both sisters fled to New Bedford for an extended vacation. Upon returning to Fall River a week before the murders, Lizzie opted to stay at a local rooming house for four days 
before finally returning to the family home. In the days leading up to the brutal incident, members of the Borden family reported experiencing strange symptoms of poisoning, and Abby had grown suspicious that someone was tampering with their bread. On the day before the gruesome incident, John Morse, Andrew Borden's brother-in-law and uncle to Lizzie and Emma, arrived to stay with the family. Some speculated that Morse's arrival coinciding with the murders was no coincidence. But he had a letter from Andrew summoning him to Fall River, which cleared him of suspicion. Around the same time, Lizzie Borden paid a visit to her friend Alice Russell, where she spent two hours expressing her distress and fears for her family's safety. Lizzie believed that the baker's bread and milk were being poisoned, as her father had too many enemies and someone was watching them. Despite being renovated into a one-family house, 92 Second Street was still divided in some ways. The single door in Lizzie's bedroom, which separated the front of the house from Andrew and Abby's bedroom, was locked on both sides with Lizzie's bed pushed against it. This made it necessary to go down the front staircase, cross the entire house, and go up the back staircase off the kitchen to get from Lizzie's room to Andrew's room. When Abby was found dead in the guest room upstairs, the front staircase would have been the only escape route for the killer. The house at the time was inhabited by five people, Andrew, Abby, Lizzie, their maid, Bridget Sullivan, and their uncle John Morse. Bridget Sullivan and John Morse woke up at 6 a.m. with Bridget going downstairs to get fuel and unlocked the side door while Morse relaxed in the sitting room. Andrew and Abby Borden joined them for breakfast at around 7 a.m. Around this time, Bridget suddenly started experiencing a headache and nausea. After breakfast, the Bordens and Morse chatted in the sitting room for about one and a half hour. Morse learned that his niece and nephew were in town and decided to visit them before dinner, giving him an alibi. Andrew walked Morse to the door at around 8.45 a.m. before letting him out and hooking the screen door. After Morse left, Lizzie Borden came downstairs and told Bridget she wasn't very hungry, but would get breakfast when she was ready. Mr. Borden went upstairs to clean his teeth while Bridget went outside and vomited. Andrew Borden left for his daily walk by 9 a.m. When Bridget came back inside, Andrew had left. Abby asked her to wash the first floor windows inside and out, while Abby went upstairs to finish up the guest room around 9.30 a.m. Bridget left the house through the side door and went to the barn to get her cleaning materials, leaving Lizzie and Abby Borden alone in the house. Abby was upstairs in the guest room, where she was later found murdered. Forensic investigation showed that Abby was facing her attacker when she was hit on the side of the head with a hatchet, causing her to fall face down on the floor. Her attacker then struck her 17 more times on the back of her head, thereby killing her. The hour between 9.30 and 10.30, when Bridget was mostly outside the house, would have been the prime opportunity for Lizzie or the attacker to commit the murders. Around 10.30 a.m., Andrew Borden returned home from the south and tried to enter through the side screen door, which was hooked shut. He then went to the front of the house and had trouble unlocking the door before knocking on it. As Bridget was cleaning the windows in the sitting room, she was interrupted by a knock at the door. She rushed to unlock it, but struggled with the lock and let out a frustrated curse. At that moment, she heard Lizzie Borden giggling from the top of the front stairs, which is a significant event in the timeline of the case. This places Lizzie near the location of Abby Borden's dead body, which was the subject of much scrutiny during the inquest. Lizzie's testimony about her whereabouts at the time of her father's arrival was confusing and contradictory. But Bridget's testimony was clear that she heard Lizzie's giggle from the top of the stairs. However, in Lizzie's defense, it's important to note that even if she was at the top of the stairs, 
she wouldn't have had a clear view of Abby's body due to the obstruction of the guest room bed. Andrew Borden entered the house and asked Lizzie where Abby was. Lizzie told him that Abby had received a note that someone was ill and had left the house. This was a lie that Lizzie repeated throughout the afternoon. If she was guilty, she was likely trying to prevent Andrew from finding Abby's body until she could kill him as well. If she was innocent, the note's existence was a mystery since it was never found and nobody came forward as the author. After Andrew Borden entered the house, he went upstairs and then came back down to relax in the sitting room. Bridget testified that Lizzie helped him into a comfortable position on the sofa. Lizzie testified that she saw Andrew take off his boots and put on slippers. But in the crime scene photo, Andrew is wearing boots, which contradicts Lizzie's statement again. Once Andrew Borden was resting on the sofa, Lizzie went to the dining room to iron some handkerchiefs. She talked with Bridget about a clothing sale nearby and encouraged her to go there. But as Bridget wasn't feeling well that day, she instead decided to take a nap upstairs on the third floor. Lizzie later claimed that her iron flats were not hot enough, so she put them on the stove and went to the barn to look for something. However, her accounts of what she was looking for and how long she spent in the barn varied. She said she was searching for iron to fix a door, lead sinkers for fishing, and that she took some pears from the yard to eat while in the barn. Lizzie claimed that she spent either 20 or 30 minutes in the barn because she couldn't do anything in a minute. However, it is more probable that she went to the barn for about 10 minutes between 10.55 and 11.05 a.m. to pass the time while waiting for the flats to heat up. Upon returning from the barn, Lizzie discovered her father's dead body on the sofa with his head gruesomely mutilated by a sharp object. Around 11 a.m., Bridget Sullivan was in her bedroom when she heard City Hall's bells chime. Shortly after, she heard Lizzie Borden call out to her from upstairs, although she couldn't specify the exact amount of time in between. Maggie, come quick! Father is dead! Someone came in and killed him! If Lizzie was responsible for the crime, she would have had only a brief period to conceal the evidence, such as disposing of the murder weapon and changing out of her blood-soaked attire. Nonetheless, it is also improbable that Lizzie had sufficient time to accomplish those tasks. Bridget heard Lizzie's cry of alarm and ran immediately downstairs to be by her side. Lizzie asked her to go across the street to fetch Dr. Bowen, the family physician. Dr. Bowen was not at home, so Bridget left a message with the doctor's wife. Lizzie then sent Bridget off around the corner to fetch her friend Alice Russell. Many have commented that if Lizzie thought her father had been murdered by an intruder, she would hardly have stayed in the house alone. But she did stick very close to the open doorway, waiting for Bridget to return. Her position at the door drew the attention of her next-door neighbor to the north, Mrs. Adelaide Churchill. Asking Lizzie through the window what the matter was, Lizzie replied, Oh, Mrs. Churchill, do come over. Someone has killed father. After Mrs. Churchill raised the alarm on the street, someone called the police station. Marshal Hilliard received the call at 11.15 a.m. The police officers who arrived at the house began to question Lizzie, and her answers were sometimes inconsistent and odd. She mentioned going to the barn but her time there and what she heard were unclear. She later settled on a less dramatic story, where she returned from the barn without realizing something was wrong. Upon entering, she placed her hat on the dining room table and checked the kitchen stove before discovering her father's body in the sitting room. When asked about her stepmother, Lizzie repeated the story that she had told her father and Bridget earlier stating that her stepmother had been called away to tend to a sick friend. But then she said that she heard Abby return and encouraged someone to check upstairs for her. 
Bridget refused to go up alone. Along with Mrs. Churchill, they both went upstairs and, halfway up the stairs, looked into the guest room by gazing under the bed. They saw Abby Borden's body lying face down on the guest room floor. Mrs. Churchill then went back to Lizzie and gave her the tragic news, saying, Yes, she's up there. Several of the officers interviewed Lizzie personally, and most of them reported that they did not like her attitude. Some of them said she was too calm, too collected, and when Assistant Marshal Fleet asked her if she knew who could have killed her mother and father, she snapped back coldly. Mrs. Borden was not my mother. She was my stepmother. My mother died when I was a little girl. Notwithstanding Lizzie's peculiar attitudes and subtly shifting alibi, no one failed to notice that she was not splattered in blood. There were not even hunts of blood stains on her hair or clothing. Lizzie was taken to her bedroom by her friends. The police attempted to search her room, but it was only a cursory inspection due to Lizzie's poor health at the time. They briefly looked at her dresses, but did not thoroughly search for evidence. The police's search of the barn was also met with criticism when Officer Medley reported seeing no footprints in the dust, which contradicted Lizzie's alibi. However, this was later questioned when it was demonstrated that other officers had been in the barn before Medley and would have left footprints. During their investigation, the police found two hatchets and two axes in the basement. Assistant Marshal Fleet set one hatchet aside as a possible murder weapon. However, a third hatchet was discovered inside a toolbox in the coal cellar, which was later known as the handless hatchet because its handle seemed to have been broken off. Several officers noticed that the break on the handle appeared fresh, and the ashy substance on the blade was different from the dust on other items in the cellar. It looked as if the handle had been recently snapped off, and the blade was covered with dust to make it appear old. The handless hatchet was later presented at Lizzie Borden's trial as the possible murder weapon. Officer Hyde, who was stationed outside the house at the southeast corner, reported a curious incident that evening. He saw Alice Russell and Lizzie Borden go down to the basement for what appeared to be a late night trip to the privy. After a 15 minute interval, Lizzie went back to the basement alone and was spotted in the washroom, bending over the pail where her father and stepmother's bloody clothes were placed. Lizzie's visit to the cellar was never fully explained. Marshal Hilliard and Mayor Coughlin visited the next day and sat with the sisters in the parlor. It was round this time that Lizzie became alarmed by their presence and attitude and asked if anyone in the house was under suspicion. The mayor answered truthfully and informed Lizzie that she was the one suspected of the crime. Learning that she was a suspect in the case may have prompted Lizzie Borden to take a desperate action the next morning. Around 11 a.m. on August 7th, Alice Russell found Lizzie tearing up a dress in the kitchen, which she was planning to burn on the fire. Lizzie claimed that the dress was stained with paint and needed to be discarded. This incident occurred in plain sight of the police and during broad daylight, and it was never determined whether it was the dress she had been wearing on the day of the murders. Because of the mysterious illness that had stricken the household before the murders, the family's milk and Andrew's and Abby's stomachs were tested for poison, but none was found. On August 8th, Lizzie attended the inquest hearing, where District Attorney Hosea Knowlton conducted the interrogation. As per Dr. Bowen's prescription, Lizzie had been taking morphine at that time to ease her nerves. The exclusion of Lizzie's inquest testimony from the criminal trial may have been the key factor that saved her life. Throughout the hearing, she gave conflicting statements, and her behavior could only be described as erratic at times, Lizzie even refused to answer questions that could have benefited her defense, such as when Knowlton asked her to describe her relationship with her stepmother. When asked if it was cordial, Lizzie cryptically replied, It depends upon one's idea of cordiality, perhaps. 
At various points, Lizzie appeared confused, stating, I don't know it. I don't know what your name is. Or confrontational, saying, Some of your questions I have difficulty answering because I don't know just how you mean them. Under pressure to remember her exact location when her father arrived home, Lizzie first said that she was on the stairs, but later contradicted herself. When it was pointed out, she said, I don't know what I have said. I have answered so many questions and I am so confused I don't know one thing from another. Furthermore, her claim of not hearing any sounds of struggle or commotion during the murders seemed implausible given the small size of the house and the brutal nature of the attacks. In the absence of her lawyer and as she was not under arrest at that time, Lizzie's inquest testimony was inadmissible during her trial. On August 11, 1892, she was served with a warrant of arrest and taken into custody. The trial of Lizzie Borden, dubbed the trial of the century, commenced on June 5, 1893, in New Bedford, Massachusetts. A jury of 12 men was selected to hear the case. The prosecution was led by District Attorney Hosea Knowlton. Let's take a look at some of their key arguments. Lizzie Borden was known to have conflicts with her stepmother, as they had disagreements over financial matters and the division of property. Just days before the murders, Lizzie was seen trying to purchase prussic acid, an extremely deadly poison, from a local pharmacy. Her request for the poison was denied by the pharmacist Ely Bentz. The judge ruled that the incident was too remote in time to have any connection, and therefore ordered to be not included as part of this case. The conversation between Lizzie with her friend Alice Russell the night before the murders fueled suspicions that Lizzie had knowledge of or involvement in the crimes, and she was preparing her defense already. During her inquest testimony, Lizzie provided an alibi that had inconsistencies and contradictions, raising doubts about her truthfulness. The police were given a dark blue silk dress as evidence of Lizzie's attire on the morning of the murders but it was later revealed that she had actually been wearing a light blue cotton dress. Alice Russell testified that she witnessed Lizzie burning a dress the morning after being informed she was a suspect, which raised questions about whether Lizzie was trying to destroy evidence. Several hatchets and axes were found on the Borden property during the investigation. The presence of these weapons, particularly the handleless hatchet, pointed to the possibility that one of them was used in the brutal murders. The absence of a clear motive for the murders led investigators to rule out the likelihood that they were committed by a random burglar. Circumstantial evidence is just as valuable as direct evidence. Most murders are committed secretly, in stealth, and are sought to be concealed by the perpetrator, and most cases involve circumstantial evidence. There is no scientific doubt that Abby and Andrew Borden were killed some time apart from each other, and the idea that the killer entered the house unseen and hid for upwards of 90 minutes is absurd. The excessive use of locks in the house is very significant. The fact that front door was unexpectedly locked with all three locks on the morning of the murders was suggestive of an assassin who wouldn't want to box himself into the house but the sign of someone inside the house who was familiar with its protocol. A killer could not have killed Abby Borden in the way in which she was slain without making some noise, whether it was Abby's body hitting the floor or her screaming or the repeated blows of the hatchet. It is unlikely that Lizzie would not have heard a thing if she were inside the house at the time the slaying happened. Abby Borden never received a note from a sick friend all Bridget knew about the note came from Lizzie as the sole author of the story. Such a note would not make sense. Why would a killer try to get Abby out of the house if he was going to assassinate her? In response to the prosecution's aggressive tactics, Lizzie's defense team, headed by Andrew Jennings and the prominent attorney George D. Robinson, sought to create doubt in the minds of the jurors. They started their arguments by saying that the jury's task is to determine the guilt or innocence of Lizzie Borden, not to solve the crime. 
Lizzie Borden's life is in the balance. And rather the true killer never be caught than Lizzie be sent to her death for a crime she did not commit. Key points from their arguments were that no handle for the handleless hatchet was found. No blood was found on Lizzie Borden's clothes. Her presence in the house is not incriminating, as it was her house, and she was free to move about as she saw fit. Her presence on the second floor does not prove her guilt. Lizzie's stories about hearing a groan or a scraping noise are not proof that she was lying. Those noises could have been made anywhere, from the street, for example. A guilty party with a false story would be more consistent in their details, while an innocent person who is struggling to remember may alter their story in slight details, as Lizzie did. Andrew Borden could not be blamed for being old-fashioned and modest in his lifestyle. Characterizing the living conditions of the Borden family as creating a possible motive for murder is a gross exaggeration. There is nothing criminal about a 32-year-old woman not wishing to call her stepmother mother. Lizzie Borden is not a saint and could very well have said something mean about her stepmother, but that doesn't mean that she would murder her. The entire family becoming sick at the same time is a not uncommon occurrence. Lizzie called for Bridget shortly after discovering the body, an act that suggests fear and innocence. Lizzie's visit to Alice Russell on the evening before the murders and the confession she made of her fears and premonitions to Alice are actions inconsistent with someone who is guilty of the murders. Lizzie and Alice's visit to the cellar was perfectly innocent. The prosecutors attempted to prove that Lizzie lied by presenting to the police the dress she wore. The prosecutors contended that Lizzie had burned the Bedford Court dress that she had on the morning of the murders. But many witnesses testified that when she wore that dress on the morning of the murders, there was no blood on it. Why would she burn a dress with the motive of getting rid of blood-stained evidence if there was no blood on it? Further, the defense had also produced a dressmaker and a house painter who verified the story that Lizzie had stained the dress with paint and was thus seeking to get rid of the dress by burning it. The handleless hatchet was dismissed and treated casually as evidence until Professor Wood declared that the other hatchets and axes were unlikely to have been the murder weapon. It was then that the handleless hatchet was suddenly thrust into the case as being significant. Even if the killer had washed the blade, the blood would have flowed into very narrow places, including the broken wood of the handle, but not a trace of blood had been found. Because the side door was unlocked and the screen door unlatched during the times of the murders, a killer could have gotten into the house while Bridget was doing the outside windows, and Lizzie was moving about the house, going up and down stairs. Perhaps the killer murdered Mrs. Borden while hunting for Andrew, and then killed Andrew at the next opportunity. If Lizzie committed the murders, she no doubt would have had to change her dress several times that morning, once after Abby's murder to remove the bloody dress, then again before Andrew's murder to put on the bloody dress again, unless there were two blood-stained dresses, and then again after Andrew's murder, and before raising the alarm to Bridget. Besides, she would have had to divide her time between the cellar where there was running water, with which to clean herself and the murder weapon, and the upstairs bedroom where she could change her dress. The nation watched with bated breath as the jury deliberated for a mere 90 minutes before delivering their verdict. Not guilty. The courtroom erupted in a mixture of shock, disbelief, and relief, while the public's reaction to the verdict was sharply divided. Upon exiting the courthouse, Lizzie told reporters that she was the happiest woman in the world. Following her acquittal, Lizzie Borden returned to Fall River, where she and her sister Emma moved into a large and luxurious house they named Maplecroft. Emma eventually moved out of Maplecroft, and the two sisters grew estranged, never to reconcile before their deaths. Lizzie lived out the remainder of her life in relative seclusion, and passed away in 1927, taking any secrets she may have held to her grave. 
In the years since Lizzie Borden's trial, numerous alternative theories have emerged, attempting to shed light on the true identity of the Borden killer. So let's get right into these theories. In his book, Lizzie Borden, The Legend, The Truth, author Arnold Brown states that the Bordens were killed by an illegitimate son of Andrew Borden, known as William Borden, who was reportedly seeking financial compensation from his estranged father. According to this theory, William's resentment towards his father and desire for his share of the inheritance could have driven him to commit the brutal murders. However, despite its intriguing premise, it was later proven by author Leonard Rebello that the William Borden mentioned in the book was not Andrew Borden's son. According to this theory, Lizzie's older sister Emma arranged the killings either as an act of revenge against her father and stepmother or in an attempt to protect Lizzie from an abuse at the hands of her father. Others speculate that the Borden's maid, Bridget Sullivan, may have had a hand in the killings fueled by her own grievances against the family and due to her love affair with Lizzie. Advocates of this theory argue that an unknown assailant, possibly a drifter or a burglar, entered the Borden home and carried out the brutal attacks before slipping away undetected. This theory is bolstered by reports of a suspicious man seen in the vicinity of the Borden home on the morning of the murders and the lack of a clear motive for Lizzie to commit such a heinous crime. However, the random intruder theory is not without its flaws. The absence of any signs of forced entry, the seemingly intimate nature of the crime, and the improbability of an intruder evading detection in the small Borden home, all cast doubt on this hypothesis. Another aspect of the Lizzie Borden case that has been a subject of speculation is the possibility that she suffered from a mental disorder. Some theories propose that Lizzie experienced a dissociative episode during which she committed the murders without any conscious awareness of her actions. Others suggest that she may have been afflicted with a personality disorder or other mental illness that drove her to commit such a brutal crime. After going through all of the evidence on this case, I have reached the conclusion that Lizzie Borden did kill her parents. Let's get into details of why I believe that she did it and how she might have done this. Other than the obvious financial reasons, I've regarded her father's act of killing the barn pigeons also a significant motive. Unfortunately, this is one of those incidents that was never verified well enough. We know that after her passing, she made substantial contributions to Fall River Animal Rescue League, indicating that this incident must have deeply impacted her. Whatever motive it could have been, we do know that Andrew and Abby Borden were murdered within a short time frame of approximately 90 minutes. This close proximity in time suggests that the murderer had intimate knowledge of the household schedule and was able to carry out the killings without interruption. No signs of forced entry were found at the Borden home, suggesting that the murderer was someone familiar with the residence and its occupants. Nothing was stolen from the house and none of the valuable items were missing. There are many reasons to believe Abby was attacked by someone she knew. Even if Bridget was outside washing windows, surely a woman screaming because a total stranger has entered the room would alert her which means stepmother was attacked by a face she trusted and wasn't given enough time to scream. Bridget being outside is the only reason she didn't hear the body's thud to the floor. Some people have stated that she was already down and looking under the bed when she was hit on the head, but I believe the former version of the events that Abby was facing her attacker to be true. Murdering the stepmother was planned and judging by the number of blows she received, she was the primary target. To me, her death seems personal and an extreme overkill. Knowing the victim is one of the main reasons of the overkill. The high number of the strikes that Abby received 
points towards someone who was inexperienced and unable to tell if the victim was injured enough to die because every moan, twitch and gurgle makes them think the victim is still alive and might survive so they administer just one more blow to make them completely silent. Murdering the father was less planned though Lizzie was happy to take the opportunity when it arrived. Maybe the father would have been murdered at a later date if no opportunity presented itself on that day. Lizzie didn't know that her father would come home early and told a lie about the stepmother being gone, so Andrew doesn't go looking for her upstairs. When she saw the opportunity, she decided to go for that, but the problem was to get Bridget out of the way. Lizzie tried to get Bridget to leave the house again by telling her about the clothing sale, but Bridget chose to lie down on her bed on the third floor. This gave Lizzie ample time to carry out her next murder. Now let's come to the question of how she did it. To me it seems that to kill Abby, Lizzie went upstairs into her room to change into the same dress with paint stains on it because she ultimately had plans to discard it. To keep her hair clean, she tied a scarf or similar item around her head while intentionally going barefoot to prevent her shoes from getting stained. Lizzie testified at the inquest that when Andrew came home, she helped him get ready to nap. He had laid down in the living room lounge, taken off his shoes and put on his slippers, and taken off his coat and put on the reefer. I asked him if he wanted the window left that way. But if you look at this enhanced photo of Andrew's body, you can see that he is clearly still wearing his suit jacket. There is one coat under the pillow below his head. As she was pressed for time here, she did not change into the old dress for this murder. She simply wore one of her father's coats on top of her dress. Afterwards, she neatly folded the coat and placed it beside her father's head. Wearing her father's coat and then tucking it under his head would be something that could get blood splattered but could be hidden in plain sight. She wouldn't need to clean it or destroy it. Andrew Borden received fewer number of blows. Or maybe by this time, the killer was more familiar with the whole process and wanted to avoid another overkill. Or it could be that the killing of the father was not personal, but rather a necessity. In conclusion, the case against Lizzie Borden is built upon a foundation of circumstantial evidence, motive and opportunity. The arguments presented before paint a vivid picture of a woman driven by resentment and greed, capable of committing the brutal murders of her father and stepmother. While the lack of definitive physical evidence presents a challenge, the combination of Lizzie's inconsistent alibis, the mysterious burned dress, her familiarity with the household schedule and her access to the potential murder weapon provide compelling reasons to believe in her guilt. It is essential to recognize that Lizzie Borden's acquittal should not be mistaken for a proclamation of innocence. In the context of the social norms and biases of the time, it is possible that her acquittal was the result of an imperfect judicial system rather than an exoneration. So, what do you guys think? Did she do it? <laughs>